Okay, good. All right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I think so we might recording. Start, rather than actually uh, taking any more time. Um, you all know that the, today's meeting is going to be with regard to the uh, auto workers in the US, and we've got Frank Hammer here. Um, Frank has been working closely with this. He's a retired UAE uh, local president, and uh, he's working with auto workers in Mexico uh, at the moment. Uh, Frank, uh, we usually go as about 20, 25 minutes, and then after that, we start with questions and contributions, if that's okay with you. Um, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I do have some prepared notes and somebody uh, be a timekeeper in case I go on too long. Would and, you like me to let you know after about 15 minutes? Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I'll do it. Please. Yeah. Sure. And uh, I don't assume I, I'm going to give some kind of context to make sure that uh, folks under have a context with which to evaluate what just has been accomplished and what just occurred with the UAW negotiations with Ford, Stellantis, and GM. Um, my background is, yeah, I worked in uh, a GM plant, two GM plants actually from 1974 to 1995, and uh, during which time I was both in production and skilled trades and was elected both a uh, bargaining chair uh, of the local and also president. And the last 11 years I spent in the service of the UAW International Union, the leadership, and was on staff uh, in arbitration uh, before I retired and have been active in the reform movement, um, certainly during that career, and also since I've retired and I'm currently been uh, very active with the Unite All Workers for Democracy, which is a reform movement that emerged in the UAW. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me uh, begin with some of the, um, what I've prepared here. So, so the context. Um, specific to the US. Over the past 50 years, the labor movement in this country has been on a decline. And the percentage of workers belonging to a union, for example, in 2022 was just 10% compared to 20% in 1983, as an example. In 22, there were 14.3 million members in, uh, in the labor movement in the US, down from 17 million in 1983. Even though in that same period, the US population grew by 50%. Union membership in the private sector has fallen to 6%, which is like one fifth of unionization in the public sector. From a global perspective, in 2016, the U.S. had the fifth lowest trade union density of the 36 OECD member nations. So with that um, picture of the labor movement in general, there's been a parallel decline in the UAW. Um, in 1979, at its peak, it had one and a, one and a half million members. Today, it has 380,000 members. Of that total, the auto sector combined today is 150,000 members in Ford, GM, and Stellantis. Compare that to in 1979, where UAW member UAW represented 425,000 members at GM alone. There are many reasons for the decline, including offshoring and automation, but it was also due to loss of market share. U.S. companies' market share in the 90s was 85%. By 2018, the uh, what we call the big three, not so, much, not so big anymore, the U.S. market share was down to 44%. In 1980, 60% of U.S. workers in auto, factors, auto factories 
were represented by the UAW. Now, that's just 18% of the workers that are union. That's because of the rapid buildup of non-union foreign-owned auto plants, primarily in the South. The South is only 5% union, half the density of the U.S. as a whole. None of the foreign companies with plants in the South are union, although the UAW has tried many times. That severe decline was coupled with the companies pressing the UAW leaders into becoming more competitive, pressing for join this team concept profit sharing, all in the 70s and 80s through, through to the present, adopting Toyota just-in-time management by stress production model. The companies were also uh, dismembered as large segments of supplier plants like Delphi, Vistian, and Mopar were spun off, intensifying competition with lower wage tier workers. And then finally, tiers were introduced internally within the main production facilities in 2007 when the UAW agreed to two tiers within the main assembly plants. And still, the UAW had not done enough to capitulate to the big companies. The resistance came from the ruling Ruther administration caucus, who were afraid to lose their positions if they gave away even more. Then came the fin Wall Street financial crisis of 2008, which overnight decimated the market for new vehicles, reducing sales from a rate of 17 million per year to 10 million prompting massive plant closures and precipitating a government-managed bankruptcy bailout, which was used by Wall Street in cahoots with the Obama administration to force draconian cuts by the, by the UAW to its wages, benefits, and working conditions, won over many years of strikes and negotiations. Any confusion over what was intended was clarified by Obama's chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who oversaw the auto tax force responsible for directing the bankruptcy. He famously said, fuck the UAW. Emanuel is the current, currently Biden's ambassador to Japan. The losses included ending cost of living allowance, first but won by the UAW at GM in 1948, no wage increases, no more health care and pensions for workers hired after the bailout, maintenance of multiple wage tiers, concessions on negotiated overtime pay, and even the suspension of the right to strike for six years. Most important, the bailout was conditioned on the UAW agreeing to match its wages and working conditions to the non-union companies in the South, thereby reversing the UAW's appeal to Southern workers by offering to bring their wages, benefits, and working conditions to the level enjoyed by UAW-represented auto workers. The capitulation by the UAW was made all the more clear when Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm, a Democrat and now Secretary of Energy for President Biden, spoke at the UAW's 2010 convention spelling out that the UAW would forgo its contentious relationship with the auto companies and instead become solely a provider of superior labor, period. This encountered no resistance from the UAW leadership at the convention, nor from the thousand plus delegates. The bailout conditions held for an entire decade, despite members' resistance, including an unprecedented rejection of the national agreement negotiated with Chrysler in 2015, followed by an unanticipated 40-day 40 40 strike at GM in 2019. Though there's been a narrative that the companies were supposed to have reinstated all that was sacrificed by the workers, once the companies were back on their feet, nothing could be further from the truth. The changes to restructuring were intended to be permanent. In the meantime, the institutionalization of the team concept and jointness had its predictable effect that the joint partners from the union side at the national level felt a sense of entitlement to live to lives and to enjoy luxuries like their management counterparts, 
which included rampant nepotism in the hundreds of appointed jobs and joint activities, which also served as a political army for the ruling caucus. The U.S. Justice Department intervened, began a multi-year investigation in 2017, which resulted in the arrest of more than a dozen officials, including two presidents, for a variety of charges of fraud, embezzlement, corruption, leading to jail sentences, all publicized extensively in the corporate media. Once reputed to be a clean and principled union, the UAW fell into the same pit where the mafia dominated Teamsters to the glee of the reactionary anti-union forces dominant in the South. So that's context. I want to speak a little bit about the reform movement. Like the Teamsters, however, there was a long-standing left-led reform movement in the UAW, of which I was a part, dating back to the 1960s and 70s. In the Teamsters, it was the Teamsters for a Democratic Union, TDU. In the UAW, it was less organized and went by various names, including far back in, in, in the late 60s, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and building uh, its peak power in the 1980s as part of the New Directions movement. The reformers for decades advocated for direct election of the national and regional officers instead of the ceremonial election of the leadership at the very controlled conventions. But we barely made a dent in the face of the controlling Ruther caucus. That is, until the corruption scandal when the Justice Department negotiated with the newly formed Unite All Workers for Democracy, UAWD, to hold a union-wide referendum wherein members could vote for change, to change the UAW Constitution to one member, one vote. We won. And in no time at all, in the 18 months between November 2021 and March 2023, there was a victorious uprising within the union resulting in the election of a reformed slate of candidates, which won each position they contested, half of the UAW's executive leadership, including Sean Fain's victory for the president's job. With UAW members beginning to re-engage in the union, the leadership in UAWD went full speed ahead, democratizing the union, encouraging participation as part of a brief but very spirited contract campaign, which they call labeled uh, record profits, record contracts, the likes of which UAW members have never witnessed. Many precedents have been set. The highly publicized members' demands, the aggressive campaign taken to the companies using corporate media, the very direct communication with the rank and file via social media, the organizing of actions in which members could participate in advance of the strikes, the organization of the strike as well, going after all three companies, but doing so selectively, growing the strike locations with each week and encouraging workers not on strike to build solidarity, to refuse voluntary overtime, and more. Unlike the under the old administration caucus, workers were free to express themselves to the media. The members' messaging was consistent with the leadership and vice versa. The tone set was very adversarial, painting the companies as driven by corporate greed at the expense of workers' livelihoods. So I want to talk a little bit about contract achievements. Um, by and large, uh, Pat, the pattern was the same, uh, I, although I know a little bit more about the GM agreement. Um, it's estimated that there's a 20% 27% increase in a compounded base wage increase for hourly employees, uh, a revival of the cost of living adjustments, uh, um, a shorter timeline required uh, for in progression employees to reach top wage, um, a pathway for employees at future battery plants to become unionized under the un union's master agreement with the companies. A significant win, yeah, so so this was very critical and we can re return and speak to that. It speaks less to the concessions that were built in the past and more of the anticipation of the conversion of the industry for the future. Uh, wages will rise over the four and a half years to $42 an hour, up from the current $32 per hour, top wage. 
that includes an immediate 11% increase um, soon, followed by 3% hikes in 2024, 25, and 26. Members will get a 5% increase in 2027. The deal, by and large, eliminates the hated tiers, especially where the company set up wholly owned subsidiaries with inferior contracts. Uh, there are other uh, measures, including $500 payments for current retirees, um, uh, current uh, members um, who were hired before uh, the bailout uh, are seeing a $5 increase to their basic benefit on the pension benefit. Um, that will increase to $1,800 a year for future pensioners. Um, and so while the agreement uh, broke ground on many things and recouped losses that we'd suffered in the past, it doesn't mean that it didn't fall short in certain, element, in certain categories. Um, most painful, and there were locals that turned down the agreements, especially a GM. Uh, there are, is not going to be a pension for future for the current employees uh, upon when they retire. Uh, they will continue to receive a 401k, a beefed up 401k, and there's no stipulation for health care for the current workers that, uh, when they retire, the ones that were hired after 2008. Um, the $500, the five payments of $500, the $2,500 that current retirees will receive doesn't make up for the losses that they've suffered because their pensions have been frozen since 2003. And they've seen a 26% devaluation due to inflation. One of the key demands UAW was um, making was uh, for a shorter work week, a 32 hour work week, which was really targeted uh, to make up for the losses in employment uh, predicted uh, to come with the conversion to electric vehicles that um, didn't make it. And there was not much, there was not no uh, addressing of team concept and profit sharing, uh, although it uh, remains intact. Uh, while the battery plants are, which were established or being established as a joint venture have now been incorporated under the master agreements there is a, an agreement that they would come in at a 75% wage level compared to the um, of the other uh, GM and Ford and Stellantis workers. Um, quoting President Sean Fain, uh, we were able to wrench back so much of what these companies have stolen from us over the past few decades. We won back billions in contract gains. We won back our dignity as auto workers. We won back our pride in being UAW. Frank, this is the 15 minutes you okay. want to let you know. Good, 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 good. So let me go to um, um, uh, the impact, impact and the narrative. Uh, the impact on the auto industry has been immediate. Uh, the UIW has undone the draconian terms of the bailout, and it has now struck fear in the hearts of the foreign uh, producers that the UAW may successfully organize their plants because there's a rising interest in how do I join the UAW. So they wasted no time trying to cut the union off at the pass and uh, at Toyota, Honda, and Hyundai, they've already raised the wages of the non-union workers and they've already reduced the in progression time at those locations, reducing them in half from eight years to four years. This is now called the UAW bump. Now, a little bit about the narrative and then I'll, I'll, I'll come to a close. Um, the amazing class warfare narrative that developed from day one of the strike, when Sh President Sean Fain declared that the company CEOs and the billionaire class were enemies, not heard from, uh, not, not heard in those terms by previous UAW administrations. The working class as a whole, and not just the UAW, Fain declared repeatedly, was at war, at war against corporate greed. Just like the Occupy movement of a dozen years ago, which targeted the 1%, the broadly held view now sweeping the US working class is that our common enemy is corporate greed. 
that this has been well received by a public of which 75% supported the UAW strike. Even more radical was the notion that we in the UAW and the working class are out to wreck the billionaire economy. Sean Fain at a Chicago rally was quoted as saying, the billionaire economy doesn't work for the working class. It is time we end it. That's not your typical strike slogan. Also, eat the rich. He said, it's our mission to turn the system of corporate greed upside down. That's what we're fighting for with our stand-up strike. And, you know, some of us might think, well, he might even be really talking about establishing socialism. Now, there was also, there was also an a, a undercurrent. I won't go into that now. International solidarity was uh, pronounced. Uh, we had uh, solidarity ties with Brazilian GM workers that went on strike. The leader of the KMU from the Philippines was at the rally with Sean Fain in Chicago. And the UAW is reaching out to Mexican workers, auto workers who are attempting to organize independent unions and over, overturn the what they call protection unions or company unions. Um, I will end with these two notes throughout the strike. Uh, Sean Fain um, repeatedly identified the Flint sit-down strike of the, of, the, of the 1930s as our uh, important heritage for the UAW. And in fact, that's where we got up the name stand-up strike um, and opened the way for UAW members in the broad working class that really understand something about the radical traditions of the UAW. And the other item is that the strike was the uh, contract, not uh, ending in four years, but ending in four and a half years with the expiration date of April 30th, 2028, the day before May Day. And this was, uh, of course, very deliberate. Uh, Sean Fain talked about the Haymarket, mar Haymarket martyrs and the struggle for the eight hour day. And once the uh, other unions in the US to design their contracts to also expire on April 30th of 2028, because he sees a resounding uh, upswell of working class solidarity, and it will be identified with May Day with its historic implications and, of course, its international implications. Last note, he, Sean Fain, quote, union movement doesn't end at the workplace. We need a political movement that can take the principles of unionism into the streets, into the city hall, and beyond. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um well uh, explained and covered a lot of issues. Uh, if I may just uh, open up the meeting to anyone who wants to ask a question or uh, would like to actually make a contribution. Oh, good. I answered all the questions. <laughs> Please go ahead. We can we good. Patrick, you need to unmute. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you for the inspiring lead off. Um, I have some questions. First, first of all, I, I, I want to know if you if you what you said now, do you have it in a written form? Because I think that would be a oui, oui. super article in our national paper. We had an article this week about the, the strike, but not about the background. It would be super if we could have it in a written form, and then we can just translate it and publish it uh, in our paper in Sweden. So that that's the first thing. Then uh, the, the other thing is, uh, I read that now that in most uh, plants there is a, a majority of workers voting for the uh, this um, agreement, but still there is a, quite a big minority voting against it. What what are the the arguments of them uh, from their side? Uh, 
so that that's the second question and the last question what what are your uh, perspectives on a further union unionization i heard that uh, sean sane had some uh, went on in, in the congress in some hearing saying that now we are going to uh, I, I, I maybe he used the, the phrase uh, recruit like we never recruited before. Do you see any, what is your yeah. view on the perspective for that? Thank yeah. you. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so I, I, would, you mind, would you mind if I just take one more question and then ask you to come? Sure. Stephanie? Yep. Um, well, first of all, congratulations. It sounds like you've done an awful lot of hard work. And also um, have a lot more to do. So, so first of all, congratulations. I guess I'm, I'm going to be. Um, I'm looking at the international perspective. Um, I, I'm I'm from Canada, so again, uh, I'm wondering uh, what has uh, how has has Canada been influenced? Have they been? But I know I think the U UAW is in Canada. I hope they've been participating uh, in the right way, in the correct way, I should say. <clears throat> Uh, and then also, of course, uh, any comments about uh, um, how it's affecting uh, or how, how it might affect uh, the UK and Ireland too. Uh, Peter, is that a question or would you like a contribution? Because if it's a contribution, I'll let uh, Frank go ahead first. Just a simple question. Uh, yeah, on. Go ahead. Uh, Frank, thanks for the contribution. Uh, uh, you mentioned earlier on that in the South of America, there's less or five percent or less of uh, unionization. Can you explain why that is, please? Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, Frank, please go ahead. Yeah. Let me. So, to to go back to uh, Patrick's uh, question. Uh, so I, I can certainly accommodate um, with a written version. Let me know when it's due uh, because I'm going to be traveling and I'll squeeze it in. But I would be very pleased if you could uh, publish it by all means. Um, and I'm going to forget the questions now. Um, the the um, yeah, I don't remember the questions in order. But in terms of uh, unionization, uh, let me address that. And if I missed a question, let me know. Um, so there's two aspects to it. To it. One is that um, by you can judge by the reaction by the Toyota, by Hyundai, by Honda, that this increased their alert level significantly for the prospects that their workers will join the union given the UAW's performance. And they will do everything they can, you know, essentially to keep the union uh, out. Uh, but I think that, uh, I mean, as soon as the contracts, the tentative agreements were reached, Sean Fain was already pivoting to the next big task for the UAW, and that's to organize the unorganized, especially at the auto plants. Um, it came relatively close to doing that under the old guard, uh, for example, at a VW plant in Chattanooga, um, because at Chattanooga, even though wages might have been comparable then, uh, the working conditions and the terms of work life were really poor. And in spite of all the anti-union efforts at Chattanooga workers, at BW came very close to unionizing. So I think prospects are going to be positive and it's going to allow the UAW to expand its ranks. Sean Fain talks about uh, at their next round of negotiations not being the big three, but being the big six. So the ambition is high. The other aspect I, I want to mention is that internally within the UAW, um, while we did, the reform movement did win, win half the positions, including the presidency of the, the uh, International Executive Board, the local unions are by and large uh, dominated by uh, officials uh, who, are, who are loyal to the old administration and loyal to the 
which included the corrupt leaders uh, who all spent jail time. And uh, so the unionization internally, in terms of revamping and reforming the internal workings of the UAW at the local level, is another mission and a, another uh, 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 goal in the sights of the reformers. And so that's two pieces of it. Uh, Patrick, I don't remember. I know. Well, I know you asked me something else, and I'm forgetting now. It was the why such a still a large minority was voted against ah, yes. the agreement. Yeah. So the uh, the votes uh, the ratification w went fairly smoothly at Ford and Salantis with like 60 70 percent uh, of approval. It was only a GM that it was down to only a 54% approval with many plants uh, actually rejecting the contract. Uh, one of the things I heard both through the media and through personal contacts was that the so-called the legacy workers, the high seniority workers were dissatisfied and felt that um, they did not gain enough in, in this, these negotiations as compared to the low tier workers, to the uh, temporary workers, to the s workers who have been sub subcontracted. And the only thing I, got, I can say in re that regard is in 2019, when GM had its 40 day strike, those very same workers um, were really advocating for the lower tier workers during that 40, year, 40 uh, day strike. And I think that, and, and we're very uh, self-sacrificing. Um, and I think maybe by, by this time around, because the contract was so much better for the lower tier workers that they felt that they should have gotten more. So that was one of the complaints. Um, certainly the uh, fact that uh, the workers hired since 2008 won't, did not win uh, health care benefits upon retirement and didn't win pension uh, uh, also factored large. and. You know, there might have been other uh, complaints. And I think that having gone through a 40 day strike just four years ago, I think that they were uh, I think they were really uh, felt a little bit let down uh, by the agreement. And that's what would account for the just a 54 percent margin. And so that did that cover your questions, Patrick? Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, good. So. Um, uh, oh, and then now uh, the question about Canada, right, uh, Stephanie? Um, so the the early on the UAW and Unifor met, and we, you know, on the outside we didn't know whether that meant that there was going to be a, a real collaboration, um, similar part, paths chosen, and as it turns out. Uh, we were really wide apart in the approach to the sets of negotiations. So Canada, the Canadian Unifor acted very uh, independently of the UAW uh, and uh, negotiated in a more traditional, uh, what had been traditional for our past by going to one of the companies, setting a pattern, bringing that pattern to the other companies, and I think in every instance, uh, the Canadian Unifor agreements uh, were endorsed by the membership. I think there was one case of a strike that might have lasted, lasted a day, maybe, I, as I recall. Uh, but it was a funny, uh, for us in the US, where the Canadians were once a member, members of the UAW, and in the mid 80s broke with UAW because of the concessionary mode that the UAW had gone into and um, President White and uh, wanting to uh, uh, take a more militant stand toward the companies and separate it from the UAW, it kind of reversed itself. And I heard many Canadian auto workers looking for direction from the UAW in the US and disappointed or disaffected from the Unifor leadership is what I heard. And then there was, and I hope that answers that question. And the other question about the U.S. South and its tradition of uh, anti-unionism, non-unionism, has very, very much to do with its roots in slavery. And the slavery um, 
and all of its economic and political manifestations um, really was also used not only um, to exploit free labor from African Americans uh, and from slaves brought from Africa, but it also enabled um, uh, a depressed, uh, depressed conditions uh, for white workers. Um, and I think that that's had a bearing in this to this day and the ideology that was uh, developed to maintain slavery and through the Confederacy and so on uh, has certainly lingered on uh, and has very much affected the consciousness of um, the working class in the South. Uh, there's a very strong evangelical movement in the South. You'll find most of the Trump support in the South. Um, so it has a lot to do with uh, um, compromised class perspectives uh, in the South um, and against collectivization. But um, I'm guessing, you know, that that's moving in a positive direction. And I think the UAW's achievements will promote that. Thank you, Frank. Andros? Uh, hello, comrades, and thank you, comrade Frank, for your in introduction. I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, I, I would also appreciate very much if, if you send us the text so that we can make use of it in our publications. Um, uh, my first question is, uh, and I'm not sure if you took it up at the beginning, uh, is what what do you think is the impact of the UAW strike on the rest of the working class? Um, I mean, it, it, it was followed internationally. It had a big impact internationally. Um, would you say that it could be opening a kind of a new period of struggle in the US working class? in the sense of other sectors following the example of the UAW workers? Well, that, that's one question. And my second question is, how do you think the establishment will react to this development in the unions, in the UAW union? Uh, how could they face this danger? Especially if it spreads, if it spreads to other sectors and we have a kind of a rise in militancy. <laughs> in the working class and trade unions, how would uh, the establishment, um, the old administration, et cetera, all these bureaucrats and um, this rotten let, let, uh, establishment of the union, but also of the state, of the country, try to fight back? These are my two main questions. But there is a lot of also small uh, question. I read one of the interviews of Sean Fain, who said that, the labor costs in the auto industry are amount only to 5% of the total cost of production of cars today uh, in the big multinationals. Uh, can you confirm this figure? It's quite impressive and quite important actually. Thank you. Um... Yeah, let me answer that first right away. I mean, that is uh, that is uh, a generally uh, consensus, um, not only coming from the UAW, but uh, economists in general uh, that don't dispute that the labor cost of producing <laughs> people in the U.S. is 5%. I think it might have been when I was working, maybe, you know, 8% or 6%, but... That, that's a pretty consensus about that that is the total labor cost in the vehicle. And you have to keep in mind that we have workers. So we have a minimum wage in the U.S., which has not been changed since 9, 2014. Uh, in dollars, it's $7.25 an hour. Uh, and this... Um, this uh, Terrible fact has enabled uh, US companies to hire, I mean, here locally, a Ford Deer a worker in Dearborn in a Dearborn assembly plant, a new hire was making $16.50 an hour. So, yeah, the labor costs were exceptionally low. 
uh, here in the in the big three. And uh, so that five percent figure, I think, resonates. Now, let me say when I was describing the context for the UAW strike, I was mostly talking about the industry of unionization, but I didn't talk about uh, the rising level of activity in the labor movement in general in the US. And we've entered a period where unions are popular, increasingly popular. And, um, you know, we have organizing drives and behemoths like Amazon, which is an uphill struggle, but it's moving in the right direction. Uh, we had the Teamsters um, major contract uh, negotiations with uh, UPS, uh, which did not conclude in the strike. They reached an agreement and in many circles. Uh, it was considered, uh, they were considered historic agreements. Um, there were strikes uh, within the ranks of the UAW, um, for example, at John Deere, um, where the union, uh, the, the brought back tentative agreements that were repeatedly rejected by the workers, so that they had to go back two, three times. So there's there is a um, an upswell, and the UAW, in other words, didn't initiate that upswell. It's part of it, but I think it contributed significantly, and I think um, I think that it, it'll have a broad ramifications. And I'll tell a, a story um, uh, just to, to give you a little bit of an insight. Um, I was speaking with a young uh, worker uh, who worked at one of the supermarket chains here in the US, Kroger's, learned from that worker that at Kroger's they had three tiers of workers. And the worker was describing to me, um, he was on a break in a break room and a TV was on. And uh, as the workers were sitting there during the break uh, is when Sean Fain was shown taking a proposal that was submitted by Stellantis and putting it in a trash can and the workers spontaneously broke out in a holler and slapped the table. And I tell that little story because I think that it's probably been repeated all over the country that um, um, it, it, it evoked a working class um, strivings or that uh, had not maybe been tapped into uh, uh, so much uh, before. And um, so, so I think that um, I think it's it's emerged from uh, an awakening labor movement, and I think it's also uh, going to be a, a significant contributor to it. Uh, Sean Fain has reported that workers are calling the UAW. How do I organize? How do I get in, in the union? How do I get? How how do I become a UAW member? Um, I would like to hear from you, and I think that people who will see this uh, recording would love to hear what the reactions are internationally to what's taking place here. We may not be hearing that as much, and so if any of you want to share what those reactions are, it would be great to hear that. Um, so then, so did I answer the questions? I think I did. I think so. Um... Steve? Right, yeah. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that, Frank. Um, there's a hell of a lot of similarities um, with the unions over uh, here. I think it's uh, probably uh, an international thing and, and, and more than likely probably everywhere. Um, the, the old right-wing bureaucracies who are um, very adept at doing deals with management and senior politicians and not representing um, the uh, workers uh, very well at all, um, have a tendency towards nepotism, cronyism, out-and-out uh, corruption. And I might say as well, some of the faux left as well um, are guilty uh, of those things. Now, we've had uh, a fairly big strike wave uh, in this country 
um, started around about June 2022, went on for 18 months. Um, <clears throat> in some unions, um, particularly the uh, nurses um, in the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing, um, got a similar sort of deal that was, you know, there was some significant uh, concessions. Um, but at the same time, it didn't go far enough. It didn't um, actually compensate for the reductions due to inflation in, in, in your uh, take-home pay and what have you. But what we saw there in the Royal College of Nursing, I mean, the, 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 the name gives it away. You know, it's not affiliated to the TUC. It's... Um, you know, wasn't even regarded at the end of last the last century when I was actually in the unions as a proper union. You know, you would say to RCN members, um, when are you going to leave that mob and join one of the proper unions? Um, but there was organisation uh, from within amongst activists, uh, shop stewards, uh, branch officers, people, actual workers uh, in the health service, uh, and, and, and they put tremendous pressure on the leadership and that is what uh, created uh, a situation where the leadership had to represent um, the interests of the members properly it's very significant as well you know that um, right-wing unions in this country are losing members at the moment and, and left-wing organizations like the rcn are, 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 are building um but you see, on this question of, of uh, recruitment, I think that was a fantastic story that you just told us about them people in that store thumping the table and cheering when he cut that uh, agreement uh, in the bin. That, that's the sort of atmosphere that uh, proper union leaders need to uh, create. But what I've always argued is that you've got to have an effective uh, shop stewards movement because... People will join uh, a union when it's relevant to them. And when you've got um, people in the workplace who can deal with the nitty-gritty day-to-day issues, the grievances, the disciplinaries, the health and safety issues and what have you, yeah, I'll join the union. It's relevant, you know. Um, and, and I'd just like to ask... Um, how are things organised uh, in the States? Do you have... When, when you talk about organising, is that sort of getting shop stewards uh, in, in, in the workplace, uh, uh, organising shop stewards committees and that? Um, you, you, you have locals out there. I think the equivalent we have over here is branches. What you see in right-wing unions is that um, largely they're ignored and full-time officials, corrupt full-time officials, uh, run the show. But when the members stand up, um, and, and they get organised in the workplace, organised in the branches, that's when you can bring about change. Is that movement developing in the States as well? So, um, well, um, let me make a, a, a general uh, response uh, to give an indication. So, uh, biannually, um, the organization, the publication Labor Notes, uh, has uh, a national conference. And you can see by the growth of the attendance that there is a budding movement uh, within many, many unions in the direction of what you're des describing. Uh, so I think they're, for example, anticipating next April, uh, like at least, you know, or somewhere around 4,500 4, in attendance. Uh, and it's going to be quite spirited. It's going to be um, quite, a, quite a phenomenon because it does, uh, it will be an expression of the growing uh, movement at the rank and file level. Uh, within the UAW, I think this is seen as one of the great weaknesses of this movement. And I intend to speak to that because when I was at uh, GM, my GM plant in the suburb of Detroit, um, it was really um, um, the work, as you were saying, day to day, responding to workers' specific issues, um, specific grievances, uh, specific concerns that 
we were able to build a rank, an actual rank and file democratic rank and file caucus that challenged the uh, established old guard leadership that was in the plant. And it was only because we did not just address general questions or, you know, uh, questions facing the entire union, but actually grievances held by individual workers and that we can have some impact or an effect that uh, our movement grew and we had power and we could be actually elected to more or less kind of take over the local union and that that's what we need at the rank and file level. And that is where a lot of the focus is going to go, as I was saying earlier. Um, because you're right, if it doesn't Im impact a, a worker in a direct way, um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to win over uh, workers who become cynical or um, discouraged. Uh, there were many workers, for example, that did not vote on these contracts. Uh, and GM alone, out of a 46,000 membership, 11,000 didn't vote at all. So you can, that's a level of dispiritedness or a level of irrelevance that needs to be tackled. And I think you've uh, hit on a very important thing, and that is it will uh, attract more union members or more workers if you were addressing the concrete life experiences. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I can't see any more raised hands. Uh, would anybody like to make any contribution? Okay, Patrick, please go ahead. And after you, I'll, I'll take it time as well. Yeah, thank you. It, there is a, a, a movement also now in Sweden. You know, we had a record low strike level for, for decades now, but now there is a, a struggle between the Swedish uh, Metal Workers Union, which also includes uh, car auto workers, uh, with Tesla. And Tesla refuses to, to sign a collective agreement. Yeah. But, uh, and this is especially difficult in, uh, or, or negative in the, in the Nordic countries, because in, in the Nordic countries, there are no minimum wages in the, in the laws. So, the minimum wages are only in the collective agreements. So in a way for, for the unions, it's a, a struggle of life and death. Uh, because if Tesla wins, then several other companies will ha have the same, won't uh, sign the collective agreement. And for Tesla, it's also important because they have this very hard principle of, you know, they don't want union, unionization of, of their plants. And if the Swedish, unions wins, then the German unions will also, you know, will want to have collective agreements. And, and we went to one of these strikes uh, talking to the workers, and it was, I mean, Swedish unions are very social democratized, they're very bu bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. But this time it was very interesting because we, want, we talked to one of the employees of the union, and it was a good uh, discussion and we ask so uh, kind of joking with them saying so do you have your baseball bats in the trunks of your cars or and the, the answer was well because Tesla were taking in you know uh, people working breaking the strike and the answer was well we're not getting physical yet mm. so and, and that would never be heard from a social democratic union guy just one or two years ago. So this is a very important strike. I don't think it's any way influenced by the, by the strikes in the US, but it's, uh, well, it's a new thing and also in the bud, just like for you. Uh, but then I, I would like to stress Andros' question because, uh, I mean, historically you have seen the US establishment and the bourgeoisie in the US starting with, with Ronald Reagan and the way he, he treated the, what's it called, the, 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 the fly, uh, flying, the people. controllers. Yeah, even putting the, the leader in jail. Uh, so do you, how do you think the establishment will, will 
what what kind of uh, what, what kind of things do you think they are able to do to kill this movement before it gets too strong? Thanks, Patrick. Um, David. Um, Frank, uh, you know, first of all, apologies that I wasn't there bang on time. Uh, I won't go into explaining why, but, uh, you know, I want to really thank you very much uh, for coming and uh, talking at short notice, and I'm sure doing a fantastic job. I uh, apologize for, again. Uh, you know, the particular interest that uh, I think I have in the uh, UAW strike was the astonishingly uh, good uh, headlines that it provided uh, to workers internationally, I'm sure in America too, uh, but, you know, in uh, South Africa, we've had a historic benchmark a while back. I think it was in 2016 or thereabouts uh, when workers demanded a wage, which was uh, basically something like a 75 percent increase on the previous uh, period. So in other words, it went beyond the usual trade union bargaining uh, situation and uh, actually broke the idea of where the parameters were, the highs and the lows. Uh, of demands that would be placed. And in the end, it ended up with, uh, um, you, you know, some bloodshed. I mean, we we, we had a we had a massacre in South Africa um, because in, particularly on the mines, life is tough and hard. And if you don't uh, bite the bullet, the bullet will come to you. Um, and so, you know, that, that was quite a marker. But in a very positive way, uh, we've seen the way in which American workers who are not internationally well known uh, for labor militancy, you know, are back on, on the map. Uh, and in South Africa, I think it was a, a surprise and, and even disbelief, <laughs> if I can say it when I'm talking to trade unionists here, that uh, the American workers have actually got something of, of this dimension. Some people don't even believe that it's true, <laughs> uh, because actually it really shows up the unions here which are trapped in a very uh, cost of living negotiation. In other words, if inflation went up by 7%, you demand 9% or something and you accept 7%. You know, it was that, uh, in other words, your range of, of, of wage bargaining is, is trapped uh, in a conventional uh, spectrum and you're not breaking out of that. And to some extent, the UAW results, which I think is our job to get out to the labor movement, we're quite a quite a break from that, and it it affects uh, you know the workers in this way. Uh, I think that up to now we've had quite a militant struggle in Europe and in Britain and elsewhere internationally to you know on, on the cost of living basis. In other words, you know the, the inflation has risen and there's a demand you know to catch up with that which is, uh, you know, quite expected, except that what has not been expected was that it would turn into a strike movement. Uh, and that was because the uh, capitalists have been adamant that they are not even going to allow a cost of living increase, which would match the, you know, the rise in inflation. Uh, so, you know, that's trapped within that spectrum. So when, when it breaks out of that spectrum, it becomes political. In, in the sense that it accentuates labor militancy in a way which is going to challenge the political parameters as well. In other words, um, you know, that uh, the, the way in which uh, the labor movement uh, addresses all the political, the range of political issues out there. Uh, so in, in South Africa, I still feel that we are, uh, you know, going to see yet uh, the impact that's going to come in the bargaining sessions, which 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 are coming in, in in the future, and we may find that we're breaking out of that spectrum. But then there's another question I want to raise. I put this up in a Facebook a little bit carefully because it's not something uh, I endorsed. But you saw that Biden turned up, and then Trump turned up as well. Um, you know, and you know there was um, in a way. I think uh, the fact was that Trump turned up in an unorganized factory, and he was trying to just get the workers uh, to solidify the non-unionized uh, an attitude of anti-unionism. Um, at the same time, uh, show his face <laughs> at a time when there was a momentous development taking place. He was trying to play it both ways, you see. But then Biden was also trying to play it both ways, uh, in the sense that. Um, 
he had, you know, came and identified, and even though he didn't do a fantastic job, if you look at the photograph particularly, <laughs> he didn't really have that, uh, you know, militant look about him at all. It was like a, a pleasant, uh, you know, it was a picnic visit, you know. But um, on the other hand, he did turn up. Now, that's quite astonishing. I don't think any U.S. president in history has actually ever showed up at a strike. <laughs> Certainly in South Africa, we've had... Um, all kinds of blah, blah militants, you know, um, the nationalist groups and the ANC and the Communist Party all say radical things at times and then say unradical things the next day. But none of them ever shown up on a strike. They don't do that ever. They don't ever turn up at a strike where it means supporting the workers' independent action. They don't do that. So, you know, I wondered if you would come back a bit on the both fronts. First of all, the idea of the spectrum in which unions tend to negotiate as one and, and whether it's as broken out of that spectrum. Uh, and the second point about the way in which even bourgeois parties like, uh, you know, the Democrats have had, and, and even Trump, uh, you know, I've tried to orientate to this because it's beginning of the labor awakening. And somehow, rather, they know they've got to play this this fact uh, very carefully if they're going to get the uh, vote uh, of uh, organized and unorganized workers. I wonder if you'd come back on some of those points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for all of that. Um, so, should I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I think the, re the reason I don't have an answer yet uh, about how are, how are the capitalists going to respond in the U.S. Uh, is just because it's kind of a little too early to tell. And the reason I'm saying that is because there's no question that the approach taken by the UAW, taken by Sean Fain, was um, quite out, outside of the box. And so, for example, he exposed uh, the incredible uh, incomes of the CEOs. In fact, he didn't even go far enough on that. He talking about their, you know, like Mary Barra allegedly making 29 million a year, Mary Barra being the head of, the, of GM. And it turns out actually, she's making over $40 million a year. But even using the $29 million figure, saying and talking about the raises that the CEOs just got over the four years, that became the slogan for the UAW strike. We want we want the same wage increase that they got. So uh, this was unusual, this was unheard of. Uh, citing the profitability of the companies over the last 10 years since the bankruptcy, of two, uh, you know, a quarter trillion dollars, two hundred fifty billion dollars. All these um, uh, ex exposures of these facts in the corporate media is what uh, made the strike uh, so uh, class oriented. And the companies and the corporate media had they were they were uh, off balance. They were caught off guard. They were unable to respond in a very effective way. I mean, and they continued like, they, at some point they began to say, well, you're threatening the whole economy. And I think that that didn't have any play in the public. 75% of the US public supported the strike. So I think that uh, the, the corporates and the, in the boardrooms are having to re-figure out what to do in response to this burgeoning uh, labor uh, fight. Um, and I think that, uh, and that includes, uh, that in I think that includes Biden. Uh, now, just to be clear, Trump was coming to the state of Michigan and announced as such before Biden announced. And there's no question the fact that Trump was coming into this volatile situation that B Biden was similarly uh, motivated to come. And it was also uh, the UAW has withheld any endorsement of Biden, uh, appeal to Biden. And voila, we had Biden on the picket line and I didn't know 
that there has been, never been a U.S. president that has gone through a picket line. So it made Biden look quite, quite you know, different. Uh, but I think it was the forces of what, what, what's been going on that compelled him and also the fact that, that Trump showed up. Now, Trump went to a non-union facility, a supplier plant, and he was there uh, to uh, basically say the UAW leadership is taking you down a rabbit hole in pursuing uh, the electrification of the industry. Uh, it was a, an entire uh, speech against electric vehicles, and that the UA and that day it's going to decimate jobs, it's going to eliminate jobs, and the UAW's pursuit is, uh, you know, is a fool's errand. So uh, that was the messaging uh, that came from Trump. Um, and honestly, I think that if there are, uh, and there are elements within the ranks of the UAW that supported Trump, um, you know, certainly in 2016. And I think that, and he attacked, and Trump attacked Sean Fain, uh, that Trump didn't do himself any favors. And uh, so we'll see how where that goes. But I do believe that um, the corporation, the corporate class, the companies did have a template in place, certainly post bailout, that was shattered in these negotiations. And I think they have to figure out and regroup how to deal with this um, rising popularity of the unions and the gains that were made by the UAW. So I think. Um, it's kind of, for me, uh, kind of a bit of a wait and see. And the one last note, uh, Sean Fain has talked very much about Tesla. And there is an organized, there was an organizing uh, uh, attempt um, a few years ago. And there is now an organizing committee that's on the ground in Tesla and California. So I think that uh, Tesla is going to be very much in the bullseye uh here and you know presumably in sweden i heard that uh uh the dock workers i think were not unloading uh, teslas in sweden i believe so uh it seems to me it's going to be one of the targets and i think that increasingly um elon musk is not going to be is not going to be a very popular figure uh, uh as he might have been at one time Thank you, Frank. Uh, I just want to add one more thing. Is, does anybody else want to make a contribution before I go ahead? Uh, Nigel. Uh, Nigel, please go ahead, then I, then I talk. Sorry, I can't get the right emoji, so I've got the wrong no, emoji. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just to, to Frank was asking us, Frank was asking us about responses in other countries, I'm in England, um, and it's been reported um, in the English media, sort of not 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 very graphically media wouldn't report on any successful union um union um activity anywhere in a very public way but it has been reported um but what I'd, i would like um from frank uh, a report so that i can give that to my union comrades and they can get a fuller fuller flavor of what's happened rather than the you know, the filtered reports we get from the British media, because the British media is no friend of trade unionism. Just to add on a little bit on what uh, was said earlier about the strikes, the strikes in the in Britain were very widespread, as comrades probably know, and not just in the private sector, not just in the public sector, but also in transport. And, you know, about 50 percent of the workers on strike were actually not in the public sector. But the nurses were an important example because that was the first time they'd struck, actually. Um, and so I think international action like this is very is inspiring for workers because, you know, you do get workers who talk down the settlements that have been made um, during the strikes because a lot of the strikes are over now. But I mean, those settlements were not complete victories in England, but they were partial victories. Mm -hmm. If the workers hadn't taken the, that action, they wouldn't have got the the improved offers that they were eventually that were eventually being made and 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 in terms and conditions. So it's important to bear in mind, you know, they didn't they didn't win everything they wanted, but it you know the the were it wasn't a defeat. Um, and so sometimes we can have the movement talked down by pessimism. 
you know, when we need to talk the movement up and see, gain, gain inspiration from our comrades in the United States who are building, because I think, you know, the unions here, new people are coming into struggle, younger comrades are coming into struggle who've never been there before, new shop stewards and so on and so forth, coming into negotiation uh, con situations and those kind of things for the very first time and, uh, you know, cutting their teeth in, in in struggle. So that sounds like it's happening in the United States, may it continue um, in other countries as well. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Frank, I just wanted to, to add uh, something myself as well. Uh, I think what we're seeing uh, probably uh, across many, many countries, uh, we're seeing a fight back uh, and the deepening of the class struggle, I think, everywhere. Uh, more and more workers are asking for their right uh, demands. And uh, we also are seeing, I think, to a large extent, politically, uh, the inability of very much of what was the old social democracy or what was the old bureaucratic establishments being able to provide an answer. Uh, politically, we see many at times across many different places uh, that uh, the distinction between what used to be called in general uh, as workers' side compared to the boss's side, uh, insofar as the general big parties are concerned, uh, that is something which everybody is becoming more and more disillusioned about. Uh, this has an impact. Uh, I think you were absolutely correct. The, the idea of that struggle uh, deepening also in US has been brewing and UAW were able to actually uh, put that into practice and show that it can be done because of the change that actually went through the place. If the change had not taken place within the UAW, uh, I think it would be unlikely to have, you would have seen the results that was gained. Uh, there was another issue which I think is important, and that is uh, the demands that were put forward. Uh, the part of uh, trying to get rid of or trying to get some sort of a balance between different tiers, uh, so to present the uh, people who are working there as one body, I think this is huge uh, reverberations everywhere. Uh, and, 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 I, and I can tell you for a fact that uh, even across the Middle East, uh, this is something which is a big issue. Uh, where there is no union or where there is a union, irrespective of the two, it's a big issue. And I think one of the main impacts of this was the ability to take over that. Uh, but the part which was not got, uh, and that was with regard to the pensions and pensioners' side, that is also one issue which has held many to wait and say, how could we actually do that the next step? But I think the main lesson uh, was the fact that uh, a change in terms of representation, uh, I mean, a lot of people here said as well, comrades did say, uh, representation is an issue. And also the idea that uh, you can't do it. I remember even during the strikes of RMT, the first one, the media was running left, right, and center like a headless chicken, trying to actually tell people, or oh, everybody's against the union, they're stopping, they're disrupting the life, and everybody was saying that's not the case. Um, and many instances like that. Uh, the general mood is, this is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, th this change would require either a change in terms of the structures or the way the unions work, the Self or more importance given to the shop sewers or direct uh, representatives, uh, but it it has to find a way of actually getting through uh, and not accepting what is the general establishment says. Uh, I'll stop at that. Uh, but before I ask you to sum up, I just wondered if there is anyone else who does want to make a contribution. No, so I'll leave it to you to. Uh, Give you a summation, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I, I've this has been great. I've really appreciated, and I really want to uh, thank David for uh, the invitation. And fortunately, we we apparently did record this, so you you will be able to see it all. Um, uh, I I um, there one facet of the UAW that may be of interest uh, as as a way of ending uh, is that um, one fifth of our membership is now academic workers. 
Uh, we have graduate students at many universities that are now represented by the UAW. So we have uh, incredible resource <laughs> in, in academic, uh, uh, you know, students who are, you know, graduates who even are, you know, achieving their PhDs and they're very much aligned with the elements in our, in our union uh, that are uh, industrial workers and auto workers. And this has really added a dimension um, that um, is, I think, quite profound. You know, the old administration uh, brought in all these academic workers because it was a way of growing the membership, considering all the losses that we took in auto. But they sort of didn't consider what it was that they were, you know, watch out what you wish for, you might get it, because now we have sort of this more uh, radical element within the UAW and more progressive uh, and younger elements, and it's 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 wonderful. And one of the ways I, I want to end this off is that there's a lot of uh, dialogue now going on within the UAW about how to respond to the crisis in the Middle East and the uh, uh, horrific uh, situation that our Palestinian brothers and sisters find themselves in. And I look forward to um, an extension of this uh, because we really, it's really is going to challenge all the unions in terms of truly uh, how do we express our internationalism and our solidarity. And that maybe will be the subject of another uh web discussion or zoom call uh but i'll leave it off with that that my heart is with the palestinians in their struggle for liberation and against the um you know and for a ceasefire so i'll, I'll end it with that thank you thank you frank for this um it was really enjoyable meeting and i think all of us managed to uh, get something uh, new and probably get a better insight uh, with regard to what has been going on uh, in so far as the meetings are concerned, uh, every week there will be uh, another win meeting. And next week, one, I think, would be sent to everybody through an email as the exactly what would be covered. Um, David or Finn, uh, am I correct? Or would we know exactly? OK, so. Um, the next meeting would be sent through email for everybody to see. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you again, Frank. Bye.